we have been adding each week to our list of what pleases the Lord. We started off with faith. You cannot please God unless you believe in Him, I guess, or even would you care. And then last week we added to the list that we love God with all of our heart and soul and strength. And we, we met a remarkable woman who taught us how this love for God must first be learned by being loved by Him. Well, today I, I want you to consider another woman. She is remarkable in her own right as well. Although she is very unlike this woman. And that she, she didn't seek Jesus out. She wasn't a party crasher. She did not have this heart experience in which now she just has to be with Jesus and, and serve Him. The woman you're going to meet, she didn't have a, a gift of perfume or, or wash the feet of Jesus with her tears. She wouldn't even have thought of it, let alone drying His feet with her hair. No, the woman I want you to meet tonight, her heart was filled with shame. Her mind raced with panic and the fear of death. You see, she had been caught with a man who was not her husband. She had been dragged from her bed of adultery by an angry mob. And judgment day had come for her as they then marched her to the feet of Jesus. And as they went, they gathered stones for her, her impending execution. Now this frenzy of a mob then finally made their way to Jesus and they demanded to know from Him, Jesus, we have caught this woman in the act of adultery and the laws of Moses are very clear that such a woman is to be stoned. What do you say? Jesus said nothing. And then he sat down. I know, that's rude, odd, awkward. And he ignored them. Definitely rude. Of course, they will not be ignored. And they tighten their grip on their stones of execution. And they make threatening reassurances that they are all too ready to hail down death upon this woman. And if a rock or two just happens by chance to land upon you, Jesus, so be it. For you seem to have no moral compass about you yourself. There they were. They were the moral superiors. They were on moral high ground. And they were on firm foundations of the very Word of God from the mouth of Moses that declared that any man, any woman found committing adultery was to be stoned to death. Now what happened to the man? We don't know how he slipped away, but nonetheless, here is the woman. And now Jesus, what do you say? We are not waiting long for your answer. And so Jesus answered. Stone her. Now, don't be shocked. This shouldn't surprise you. You heard from Jesus himself say that not the least letter of the law, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law. He had not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but he came to fulfill them. And if you believe that this perhaps is far too harsh a punishment for this woman's crime then also know with sober mindfulness that you too and myself will face this same judge with these same laws. And every immoral thought and behavior will be exposed before him. But what Jesus would ask of these before they stone her, which he has given his permission, he asks that they consider which of them is without sin. 
and to line up behind that person because that's the person who's going to throw the first stone. Make no mistake, morality is the law of God. It pleases Him when we do what He says with the right heart, with the right timing, with everything done in its proper way. God's wrath truly is going to be poured out on all of the sexually immoral and impure. And that's anybody who's had sex outside of the confines of marriage. But the immoral also include those who are greedy. Those who have cheated on tests. Those who've lied to their parents. Those who have been filled with all kinds of lust looking at pornography on the internet. Those who have their hearts clouded with covetousness and desire for things and material objects. Those who have failed to love their neighbor as themselves. Those who have failed to love their enemies. Who has ever broken the least of these commands is judged by the laws of Moses as immoral and unfit for the kingdom of heaven. These words cut to the heart of all who are gathered before this woman with their stones. And having been cut to the heart, each dropped their rock and they walked away until Jesus and he and he alone remained before this woman, for he truly has no sin. He is our moral superior. He has every right. No, let's, let's take it up a notch. He has every obligation from God to cast the first stone. But he says to this woman, neither do I condemn you. As you and I today hear Jesus say these words, we are tempted, I know, because me too, tempted to think, oh, Jesus, he's so kind. He's so nice. He's always like that. If any one of you are tempted to have a similar kind of thought, I have but one word for you. Wrong. 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 Jesus was not being nice. He wasn't just going easy on her because he felt bad for her. I mean, oh my goodness, what did those men do to you? How, how shameful that they just went right into your house, drug you out here. That's awful. You've been through quite an ordeal. Surely that's enough. You know, surely you've been through enough. And you know what? Just take yourself on home. You, you, you are forgiven now. Just don't do this again, right? We have a deal? Deal? Okay, get out of here. This woman and the man who is absent at the moment, and every woman and every man, you and I included, must give an answer for our immorality. For every sin and evil thing that we've done, God doesn't give anybody a pass. Because our evil and our sin wreak such devastation upon relationships upon the world. Even take just the one example sin that we've been kind of hitting pretty hard tonight of adultery. Why, just think of the, the brokenness that it causes young children to have their mother and father no longer in the same house. And all of the emotional turmoil that goes, that they go through. Why, just consider the how women are objectified. They're simply their body parts in a man's mind when it comes to adultery. And a man then is lost in his lust with no one to check it, no one to bring him out to what is right. And in the end, both genders just despise each other for what is truly in their hearts. And then think of the witness it is to the rest of the world, the unbelieving world who sees us on our, our moral high points and, and throwing rocks down at them for their sexual lives. And they think, you hypocrites, who are you to be throwing stones at me? And they're right. Sacred vows that have been spoken before God are broken along with the hearts that were once sincerely speaking them. But of all the offenses that this particular one sin has, it compares with nothing 
to the travesty that it causes against God. It dishonors God and it breaks love with Him because you have chosen to love yourself more than Him. So as Jesus says to this woman, neither do I condemn you, He is placing Himself into that same condemnation. Not only now does it fall on her, but now He must answer for this as well. For truly, God does not give anyone a get-out-of-hell-free card. But perhaps, perhaps now the cross comes into better view. Its purpose, its necessity. To see that here, here is the reason that Jesus can say to this woman and release her from her condemnation because it has fallen on Jesus. The full weight. You see, the law has not been abolished. It's been fulfilled on Jesus and in his death. And if then you can see clearly the cross and its purpose and its value and, and what has been done for you, then see also the empty tomb and the stone that has been laid aside. For that stone will never be raised again against any of those who belong or are with Jesus. Because the Father has accepted the answer that His Son has given. As He says, neither do I condemn you. The Father accepts that because the law has been fulfilled in His Son's death. And now, every person, regardless of their moral standings, high or low, every person who is now with Jesus, you may hear these words and know that they are just as true for you as they were for that woman. Jesus says to you, neither do I condemn you for a lying, our cheating, what's inside, what's done outside, in our bodies, with our bank accounts. And if you have been freed from condemnation, as Paul says, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ. Your sins are forgiven. All of this then has been made possible by the death and resurrection of Jesus. And now see the necessity of the baptismal waters. Because it is here that you truly have died with Jesus. Not just metaphorically, not just poetically. You truly have died with Jesus in his death. And you have been raised with him in his resurrection. And now with this new life, you truly have a power beyond yourself to live the words of Jesus when he says, Go now and leave your life of sin. Doing so not under the legalisms of the rules, but a heart that has been set free. And so think for just a moment. The woman from last week, the sinful woman, right? Who, who was so changed that her heart just would not allow her to sit in her house, but she had to go find Jesus, crash the party, wash his feet, perfume him and everything. What if that woman and the woman today are the same woman? And this is how she met Jesus. Caught, ashamed, condemned to die. But rather than words of justice, grace, and mercy. Well, whether this is the same woman or not, it is a vivid picture of a life that truly has been relieved and set free from condemnation and is filled with the love and the grace and the new life of Christ. It is a life in which you and I are invited into as we truly do leave our vices and immorality behind to live in this life with Jesus, empowered by this love. There was a really good friend of Jesus, and he wrote about this. And I want, in, I want to invite you to read these words of Peter with me right now. As we say together, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him 
who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Adding to what you have been given, you have a participant's role to play in this faith. By grace you have been saved. By grace you're led into this new life. By grace you put into practice all that you've heard. And so the take home today the spiritual discipline I invite you into this week is fasting. In that you take something in your life that has consumed you, or it is a great desire, like food, could be something else like Facebook, and spend for a time not indulging it. And the goal isn't simply to go without, to prove you can do it to yourself, but it is during that time that you're fed by Jesus himself. So that if you do a fast, you could eat your evening meal, then go through the night, skip breakfast, skip lunch, and then eat again that evening, a 24-hour fast. And during that time, you feel the hunger. You can be feeding upon Christ and talking and asking that from His resources, training your body for all the desires that are beyond food that it demands. It could be any kind of thing, but fasting is a regular and a normal part of being a disciple of Jesus because we need it. Not to be saved, not to make us righteous. It's just wisdom. It's the smart way in which training happens. So I invite you to take home uh, the card that's on the entryway table. For right now, let us stand and confess our faith.